Good morning. Welcome to the online service of Shore Presbyterian Church. It's good to have you worshiping with us this morning. Let me pray for our time in God's Word. Heavenly Father, open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to hear what it is you have to say to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as some of you uh, might know, we have put an offer on a house and it's under contract. So you can certainly be praying that everything with that will go smoothly. Um, the, the inspection's tomorrow, so pray for that. Um, and for the past year though, we, we've been renting a house and uh, you know we kind of wanted to come to the area and we wanted to get an idea of the area before we bought. Um, and so this past year of renting has been my first renting experience since college. Um, so in between college and now, I've owned two houses. Uh, and so let me tell you, there is a difference between owning and renting. It's a difference and it's a huge difference. Of course, there's a, the financial difference, right? But, but what I want to focus on is the attitude difference between renting and owning. You see, when you're, when you're renting a house, you don't have the same, same commitment to the property as you would if you owned it. For, for example, I just can't bring myself to weed the garden in a rental. Uh, it's just so hard to justify spending time and energy to improve a house that I don't own. I still treat the house well because I live in it, you know, and I want it to be nice. And, uh, and also there's probably some, some legal liability there. If I were to destroy the house, I would be responsible for it. But when I owned a house, I always had like a list of projects that I wanted to do to improve the house and make it more valuable. And with that list, there was both excitement about what that change would be and how it would make the house better, but there was also disappointment when I would see what that project would cost me. And in renting, I haven't had the excitement about an improvement, but I've also avoided the pain of fixing things and having to pay for those repairs. Uh, but with that added responsibility of ownership comes great value and a feeling of investment. And, and today we're going to pick up the discussion that we started last week where Jesus tells a parable about sheep and their shepherd. And in the parable, he, he's showing us something about himself. And after he gives the parable, he, he starts to explain the parable. And last week we saw how he explained that the door or the gate of the sheep's pen was a symbol for Jesus. It showed that he is the right way, he is the only way, and he is the life-giving way. And we saw that the shepherd comes in through the gate, whereas thieves climb in over the fence. Uh, and this week we'll see Jesus is also the shepherd, all right? The shepherd is a symbol for him. And, and, and we will see the difference between the shepherd who owns his flock and the shepherd who is a hired hand, right? He's hired to tend someone else's flock. And so I want to look at this passage under three headings. The nature of ownership, the unity of ownership, and the price of ownership. All right, we'll be looking particularly at John 10 verses 11 through 21, but I'm also going to read the parable again um, so that you can hear that, and that's verses 1 through 5. So I'll read verses 1 through 5 and then jump straight to uh, verse 11 and read 11 through 21. Uh, God has something to say to you today. Hear it and apply it. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he was brought out all, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay 
down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words, and many of them said, He has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? This is the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. So let's start by looking at this passage under the, the, the heading of the nature of ownership. All right, We see in, in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am a good, am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my life down for the sheep. See, just like a renter doesn't want to spend his time and energy weeding and caring for a garden, a hired hand doesn't want to risk his neck for sheep that aren't his, right? It's actually kind of a common trope in movies. We've, we've seen this when, when, when someone comes in and tries to rob a bank, the teller complies, you know, it, it isn't their money. Why risk getting shot for, for money that's insured and, and belongs to someone else, right? But if someone tries to rob like a mom and pop convenience store, you know, the owner behind the, the counter goes down to get the money and comes up with a shotgun, right? <laughs> we all understand that there's a difference between the owner and the hired hand. But do we recognize the ownership Jesus has of his sheep? All right, do we recognize that Jesus is the owner of his sheep? I think sometimes we miss this point. So by pointing out that the hired hand does not own the sheep, Jesus is implying that he as the good shepherd does own the sheep. Combine that with verse 16, which says, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. You combine those two things, and we have a clear claim to ownership. Even with, with the other sheep that he has yet to gather, there's, there's a sense in which even before the sheep become his sheep, they are already his sheep. He owns them in advance. And, and this isn't the only place that we get this sense of Jesus claiming his sheep or his people even before they are his. All right, We have, we have it unpacked a little bit more in Romans 8, uh, verse 29, it says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And, and in Ephesians 1, 4, um, he speaks of, uh, it's, it, Ephesians 1, 4, Paul speaks of Jesus' sheep. He speaks of his people, Jesus' people, by saying, Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. And even later in John's gospel, um, John 15, 16, we'll see Jesus will say, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So what are we seeing in these verses? We're seeing a doctrine of grace known as unconditional election. The idea behind the doctrine is that when God set out to create the world and to redeem it, he knew exactly who his children or who his sheep would be. And he would set out to rescue them from sin and death, and he would not be thwarted. This doctrine, it's not a made-up doctrine. People didn't make up this doctrine. It's merely a matter of looking at all these scriptures that we've looked at, pulling them together, and understanding what the Bible says about who Jesus is and what he does. Jesus has his sheep. The Father has sent him 
to redeem them. He will not fail. That's the idea behind unconditional election. He has chosen you. It has nothing to do with what you've done. He has chosen you by his good will, and he will save you. Uh, the thing is, it, it's hard for us to swallow this teaching because we don't want to be chosen from the beginning, right? We, we want to be chosen because we're good. Uh, you know, we want to be chosen because we're special. We want to be chosen because we made the right decision to become Christians. We want to be chosen because of something in us. I hate to break it to you, but Jesus knows you better than you know yourself. And what he knows about you is that there is nothing within you that is worthy of being chosen by him. And yet, in your unworthy state, in your fallenness, your brokenness, your sinfulness, Jesus chose to love you. We see this echoed imperfectly um, in the relationship of marriage, right? Where the analogy breaks down is that nowadays, many people um, marry because of virtue in, in the spouse, right? Because of what they think their spouse can provide for them. Uh, maybe they think they can provide security. Maybe it's a sense of belonging. Maybe it's just a feeling of being valued. But the thing is, in almost all marriages, the reality of the situation doesn't live up to the expectations. And it's at that point uh, that a choice must be made. Do I move on and search for what I want elsewhere? Or do I choose to love this person despite their flaws? And that point is what we see here in Jesus. Jesus made a choice. Jesus made a vow to make you his. And nothing is going to stop him from keeping his word. I love how uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible explains Jesus' love for us. It calls it, it says, it's a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love. Which means that there is no danger that would cause Jesus to flee in fear like a hired hand. Jesus is in it to win it. He is in it for the long haul. You belong to him and he means to protect you. And in contrast to the hired hand who leaves allowing the wolf to snatch and scatter the sheep, the good shepherd says this, which is a little sneak peek into uh, next week's passage. He says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is the nature of ownership. And because you belong to Jesus, you should feel as secure as you possibly could be. You should know without a shadow of a doubt that you belong to him and have a place with him. And you should realize how much he values you, that he would lay down his own life for you. Now, the question inevitably arises, who is the hired hand in this analogy, right? What's the symbol, what's the hired hand symbol representing? And while I don't think that a, a direct correlation is necessary here, other than to show who Jesus is uh, via the contrast between the good shepherd and the hired hand, I think that's the main point. I still can't help but let this question of who the hired hand is convict me a little bit, right? So, so here's a little glimpse into my devotional life. When things get hard as a pastor, uh, as an under-shepherd, Maybe there's, a relation, there's relational difficulties. Maybe there is a deep hurt. Um, it would be easy for a pastor to, to move on from those circumstances, right? It would be easy to run from danger. But if I want to be a shepherd in the image of my shepherd, I must truly care for my sheep as he does. I must be willing to love them even when they hurt me or even when they run away. I want to never lose the sense of ownership. Not, not that I own the people in my church, but I want to own my role as a shepherd. I don't ever want to become a hired hand who is just phoning it in. I, I want to passionately care about my flock. That's the type of love my Jesus has, and it's the type of love I pray he empowers me to maintain in my ministry. It's just the, the nature of ownership. And now I want to look at the unity of ownership, all right? So we've seen the nature of ownership, we've seen how it gives more investment, but now we're gonna see that there is a unity 
because of Jesus' ownership. Let's look at verse 16 here. It inserts an interesting idea into this passage. Uh, it's the idea of, of gathering different sheep into one unified flock. Let me read it. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For one verse, there is a lot going on here. All right, To start this comment about other sheep not of this fold, it, it's kind of confusing. Um, because even though this is Jesus' explanation of his parable, he's still using figurative language. Uh, and, and it's kind of hard to understand what he's what he's talking about here. And there have been multiple theories about this verse. You know, some scholars believe that Jesus is speaking about other Jews who are dispersed around the world as a result of the Babylonian captivity. Um, some believe that he's referring to the Samaritans and that they're going to be brought into the flock. And, and I've even heard this verse used as a claim that there is extraterrestrial life, right? Like that Jesus is going to save even those on other planets or something crazy. But, but most scholars have a consensus that what Jesus is referring to here is the Gentiles, all right? So the Gentiles who will become believers, they are the others who he's going to bring into his flock. And to be honest, it doesn't matter which of these you believe uh, because of the unity of it, right? Because Jesus is claiming that when he gathers them, they will all be part of the same flock. They'll be as part of the same flock as the Jews he's speaking to. Uh, at least the Jews he, who come to him by faith with, with whom he's speaking. All right, so, so this unity mentioned here, it, it's important for several reasons. All right, first, it shows that Jesus is the only way to become part of God's flock. All right, there's one flock and there's one shepherd. There isn't another route. All religious paths do not lead to the same place. I recognize that this is an exclusive claim and that it's hard to hear, especially in a postmodern world that we live in. But this is what the Bible claims about Jesus. He is the only way. All right, second, it highlights an equality between uh, the Jews and the others, whether they be Samaritans or, or other Jews or Gentiles. There's an equality between them, right? All people groups have equal access to God through Christ. There is one flock, one shepherd. If this were not true, he would keep the flocks separate, right? So this equality applies not just to the people back then, but it applies today uh, to any other divisions that we might think of or come up with. If you come to Christ by faith, you are united into the one flock, regardless of your race, your nationality, your intelligence level, your employment situation, or, or even the particular sins that you struggle with. We are all one flock, and we are all in need of the Good Shepherd. All right, and so this, this flows naturally into the third reason why this unity is so important, which is that the unity mentioned here eschews any us versus them mentality. All right, in the flock of God, an us versus them mentality is completely foreign. It's, it's not correct. All right. As Christians, we are different, all right, from the world around us. We are the, what the Bible describes as a holy priesthood. We are set apart from the world. And so in that sense, there is an us and a them. But the thing is, we don't know how many of us are still in them, right? St. Augustine, a fourth century church father, said, even as there are many wolves within the church, so there are many sheep outside the church. And since the gospel is to be proclaimed to the whole earth, it is better to assume a we mentality than an us versus them mentality. All right? We shouldn't look down on those who are not currently in God's flock because there was a time when we weren't in God's flock, right? There's a time when we were like them. And, and, and it it's nothing that you've done to earn your place in Christ's flock. You were chosen from the beginning and you were gathered in. And God could be gathering in those people as well. There's nothing to boast about. When we see people trapped in sinful lifestyles, we should not judge them. We should commiserate 
And we should show them where we found relief in the saving work of Jesus. If we treat others this way, rather than shunning people, our kingdom, this kingdom of God that we are a part of, will be all the more beautiful. Which brings us to our last reason that, that this unity pictured here is so important, which is because the good shepherd is still gathering his sheep, our goodness and beauty, like his, should be winsome. All right? So the good from good shepherd, the word is, uh, the Greek word is kalos. All right? And, and I think good is a fine translation for that word. But just as in English, uh, the word good has a semantic range, right? Like it can mean many things. Um, and so Temple, a commentator, a scholar, uh, says that it's important that the word for good here uh, is one that represents not the moral rectitude of goodness, nor its austerity, but its attractiveness. All right, We must not forget that our vocation is so to practice virtue that men are one to it. It is possible to be morally upright repulsively. All right, I think that's a good point. Um, you know, I think, I think it's a good point. We, this week we wrapped up our study on relationships, and in this final chapter, the author showed us that the gospel should be moving out into our world through our relationships, okay? We as believers should be salt and light to the world, as they use that scripture to, to speak to us this week. And they said that, that this ministry of being light is not a ministry that benefit, benefits from an I've arrived, but you need grace posture, all right? That mentality is repulsive, okay? What is attractive is a humble view of ourselves that we are just as in need of grace as everyone we come in contact with. Because we are all one flock under one shepherd, owned by him in unity, our lives and attitudes should reflect his life and attitude. And think about how humble he was that he would lay down his own life. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Because of the nature of the unity between the Father and the Son, and then, of course, between the Son and his flock, we should be conformed to his image. But that process of conformity is not easy, and it's not free. Which brings us to our last point today, the price of ownership. Okay, the price is made clear from the outset of this passage. In verse 11, we see he says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So Jesus alludes to it immediately in verse 11 here, and then he comes back to it again in verse 15, as we've just seen. And then he ties it all together at the end of his statement in verses 17 through 18. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from the Father. The price of ownership for this shepherd is his very life. While a hired hand runs in fear, the owner of the sheep stays and fights. But the thing is, Here's where the analogy breaks down a little bit because while a shepherd owner might risk his life to protect his sheep, his goal is still to maintain his life in the process, right? What good is protecting your sheep if you aren't alive to enjoy them, okay? But Jesus' expressed mission is to die. And it's not an accident that he dies, like it would be if the shepherd who is protecting his sheep is mauled by a bear. That would be an accident. What Jesus is doing is not an accident. With the shepherd, if he's killed, the sheep are easy prey. But Jesus, when he is killed, his death is a means to save the sheep. The assumption is that, that the sheep are in mortal danger and that in their defense, the shepherd loses his life and that by his death, they are saved, okay? 
so that we don't confuse this as a casualty of the shepherding business, Jesus makes it absolutely clear that it is by his own authority that he lays it down and takes it back up again. D.A. Carson, a biblical scholar, uh, says, Jesus' point is that the sacrificial death of the shepherd, when it occurs, must not be taken as an accident of fate or merely as a tragedy perpetrated by misguided men, but as the Father's plan. Okay, this death, this substitution, has been the plan since the beginning. Even at the foundation of the world, when Jesus was choosing his flock, he was intending to die for them. Jesus' death is not a plan B. It's not a last ditch effort to fix what we messed up. It was the plan and it was the charge of the Father from the very beginning and the very reason that the Father loves the Son. Now that statement in this scripture here, is, it, it can be a little tricky, so Carson clarifies it very, very succinctly and I'll just let him do that. He says, it's not that the Father withholds his love until Jesus agrees to give up his life on the cross and rise again. Rather, the love of the Father for the Son is eternally linked with the unqualified obedience of the Son to the Father. His utter dependence upon him, culminating in the greatest act of obedience now just before him, willingness to bear the shame and ignominy of Golgotha the isolation and rejection of death, the sin and curse reserved for the Lamb of God. Can you see what a price is paid? Can you see the value of the perfect Son of God? Do you see the sacrifice it is that he would lay down his own life for you? Do you see Jesus as your good shepherd, your beautiful shepherd, your worthy, honorable shepherd, do you hear his voice? I pray that in these words, you hear the voice of your shepherd. I pray that as you hear him calling you, that you will follow him. Stop listening to the other voices, run from them. Hear the voice of the one who paid the greatest price for you because he loves you because he cares for you. Not like a hired hand, but as one fully invested in your life and prospering like an owner. Hear the voice of your shepherd and follow. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you gave us your son. You gave us his life laid down for us and then taken back up to show that he is in control to show that he has power over sin and death. Lord, we could never thank you enough for this gift. Lord, help us to be, to hear his voice in this gospel message and to follow him, to give our whole life over to him in obedience as he gives obedience to you. Lord, let this gospel message ring out in our lives in the way that we act towards people. Let us be humble, recognizing that the, the most precious Son of God was given, his life was given, because we were that broken. That should humble us. Lord, let us also be encouraged to share the hope that we have, because Jesus is a shepherd who loves and cares for his sheep, and he has more sheep to gather. Let us be part of that gathering, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.